Hello, and welcome back to the Offspring Magazine podcast. I will be hosting today's podcast together with Nico. We will be talking to Dr. Joris Dalen, who is a researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Aging. We will be talking to him about the current research in aging that is taking place in his group as well as within the aging community. And we will be learning all about how to slow down the aging process and how to prevent us from getting old. We are really excited to have Joris on today, so let's just jump straight into it. Welcome, Joris. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this podcast. We're really excited to have you on. So do you want to start off by maybe introducing yourself and telling everyone what you do? Yes, I'm uh, Joris Dalen. I'm a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging. And, and I study aging and more specifically the genetics of aging. Uh, and I'm also looking for biomarkers of aging. So specific substances in the blood that can predict how long you will live. Um, so I started as group leader last year. And before that, I did my uh, postdoc also at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging. And before that, I did my PhD um, in, at the Leiden University, University Medical Center, uh, where I already worked on aging. So since the start of my PhD, I've been working on aging. That sounds really, really interesting. A lot of aging. So I guess the first question would be, how do you keep yourself young? Since you probably are an expert in aging, what do you do? Well, I should say that I know what I should do, but I do not always comply with that. I mean, what what is quite clear from research um, that has been done mostly on model organisms, but also a bit already on humans, is that if you eat a bit less than you need, and if you exercise more than enough, um, that you, that's actually healthy for you. And that's probably uh, helping you to keep your body healthy and, and live for a longer time. But I have to say, uh, it's hard to comply with that also for myself. Um, although I try to do it a bit, but not so extensive um, as I probably should um, to be sure that, that I have an increased probability of living longer. So you mentioned that eating a bit less and exercising was um, was help, was beneficial. In what way and what kind of things would you recommend? So I've heard that um, I've heard a lot about intermittent fasting, how that can help with aging. So maybe you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So the, so so the initial studies that 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 looked at this were in animal models, um, and what they showed is that when you to fasting in animal models that that extends your lifespan or the lifespan of these model organisms, probably because their bodies work less than um, they normally do. So kind of because you you starve yourself, you save some energy, and that is potentially beneficial. Um, but they also realize that this is not really feasible um, to do in humans. So they now came up with with some alternative strategies, and one of this is intermittent fasting, which means that you um, normally eat and then you fast for some time and then you normally eat again and you fast for some time so it's kind of um, always eating fasting eating fasting um, and there are some hints that that is also uh, well, at least in model organisms is also beneficial for health um, and now the first trials in humans are ongoing to see if it also works for humans but they at least know that it's it's definitely healthy for some uh, helping against some age-related phenotypes, uh, let's put it like this. So we know that it's healthy for you, but if it really is good enough to make you live longer and healthier, that we have to see. I mean, these studies um, need to be done. But this is one of the things, yes, it's so intermittent fasting is one of the ways that you could potentially extend uh, or, or become healthier. Um, but there are also um, specific dietary restrictions, so in, in not... Uh, eating, for example, a lot of protein or um, eat other things, let other things be uh, missing from your diet. Um, let's put it like this. So there are specific components that in our in our diets that we have today that are unhealthy for us. And if we remove these kind of components, that could already help. I mean, we know that we are really 
unhealthy eaters at the um, as as humans nowadays and eating a bit more healthy um, more balanced is also already good for you so you don't necessarily need to fast but it could also be changing your diet in a way that you get still all the nutrients you need um, but you do not eat too much because we as humans nowadays eat too much and that is actually causing our bodies to um, to deteriorate so you mentioned that we should reduce the amount of meat that we ate right uh, that we eat so why exactly do we need to reduce that no, so not necessarily meat. I think we just need to reduce most of the things that we eat. So I think it, it's it's important that it's balanced. And our society nowadays eats a lot of fat and a lot of meat. And that's not good, of course. So if you can eat a bit less meat, that would be good. But I don't say that you shouldn't eat meat at all. Um, or that you specifically should need to reduce your meat intake. It's more kind of you have to balance it a bit more. But some... some um, Studies have, for example, shown that eating fish is, is very healthy. So maybe you can replace um, um, some of your proteins with fish proteins. I mean, there, 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 there's a lot of research ongoing, which is not my expertise about nutrition. Um, but what we do know, if you look at health, um, that eating a bit less and balanced is the way that we should go. Do you by chance know how to say, okay, uh, what is the regu the good amount uh, like to eat? Uh, like in these studies with the uh, restriction, I assume they like limited to a certain amount. Uh, so what would be good for, like for a normal human uh, to eat? Yeah, so what they show in animal models is if you do, so for example, 25% caloric restriction, which is quite a lot, uh, that it has benefits, but this is not feasible in humans. So most studies now in humans go for a little bit less, um, say 12.5%. And sometimes also in combination uh, with exercise, so that you, um, on top of that, you eat less, you exercise more so that your body starts burning more. So you also lose calories. So then with that combination, um, you might be able to, to get to uh, a level, hopefully to 25%. But adhering to that is really hard. And that's also what we have seen in our own studies um, and in other studies that have been done that adhering to such a stringent uh, diet is, is not really easy for people. What, what they also show is that the longer you, you keep doing it, the easier it becomes. Um, but still, I mean, especially dietary restriction is, is hard to adhere to. So that's why not a lot of people are doing it, actually, because it's still, um, still hard. And that's why the intermittent fasting, for example, came up, because that is something that is more easily to adhere to. Um, so... People are trying that out now, um, and there are also really clinical studies ongoing that hopefully will show if it is if it's really healthy for us or if it's only healthy in animal models, which could also be the case, of course. So, why exactly does calorie restriction help us with aging? What kind of mechanisms are going on there? Yeah, so the main mechanisms that, that people are thinking that it works on is the, the mTOR signaling or the insulin signaling. So um, this is a really important mechanism in our body that regulates um, your glucose intake and your nutrient intake and then starts all the downstream processes afterwards. And this mTOR-related signaling is seen as kind of the core component regulating how we respond to food. Um, so the community thinks and focuses mostly on this pathway and says, okay, if we influence this pathway, um, for example, by dietary restriction, then that is beneficial because the pathway is working differently and that is beneficial for your health in the end. But there are also specific kind of medication that work on this pathway. So in an, as an alternative to, to doing the more uh, healthy, I would say, um, lifestyle um, interventions people are also of course thinking a lot about pharmacological interventions that do the same thing so that instead of them having to eat less or exercise more they just take a pill which has the same effect um, but i'm also not so happy to promote that because i actually think that people should start uh, with themselves and eat, eat a bit healthier before they would grab the, these pills that could do the same trick but it's possible now at least for sure in model organisms 
to take specific to give them specific substances that also influence that specific mTOR pathway and that in that way lead to uh, to longevity of these animal models. Yeah, so I've actually heard um, that in within the aging community in general, it's accepted that metformin tends to help with aging, and maybe it acts on mTOR. I'm not entirely sure. So, um, what what do you think about metformin? So, I, I know you've already mentioned that you're not a massive fan of these drugs, but if they're accepted to help aging, um, and people can't do the healthy lifestyle or calorie restriction, would you recommend them, or better to stay away? Yeah, so metformin is one of the, the strongest uh, found effectors of, of, of lifespan. Rapamycin is even stronger, um, and that is really known to be specifically targeting mTOR. Um, so metformin is, is really popular because it's already used in diabetes. Um, so it has an influence on your glucose metabolism, and we know that if you influence your glucose metabolism in a, in a good way, that it's also beneficial for overall health. Um, so that's why it's so popular. And it's also the first drug that they are really now going to try to use in a clinical trial for aging. So there is this, this study, which is called the TAME trial. Um, and in that study, they actually use um, this drug to see how it affects different kind of age-related phenotypes. So normally, this is really, this is really groundbreaking because we as a community had a hard time to convince people that aging should be treated as kind of a disease and that we should do this kind of clinical trials. And now metformin is the first drug where they actually have convinced the, the FDA to do this trial. And now we will see if they then, so they will give this healthy individuals, they will, they will give them metformin and then look at all kinds of different phenotypes that we are known to be influenced by aging to see if they improve. So to see if it's not only glucose metabolism and type 2 diabetes, but actually more general health um, that is then influenced by this drug. So that's why you read a lot about metformin, because they push that forward. Although the community itself thinks that rapamycin and these kind of rapamycin-related compounds called Rapalox are potentially better, but they have more side effects. So they have not been used in clinical trials for aging yet, but probably it will be on the list to be the next ones um, if these metformin trials show some promising results. I mean, these kind of drugs sound uh, like, I don't know, like a wonder drug, like some kind of pill you just take and all of a sudden uh, like you uh, live longer. But as you mentioned already, there are some side effects to them. Uh, so how well are those studied and especially the side effects? Um, Yeah, so, so I mean, um, the drugs that I'm talking about now are already used in the clinic, um, but for treatment of specific kind of diseases. And there they also see this, this side effect. So rapamycin is, is um, if I say it correctly, used for cancer treatment, for example. But it's known that you can get nauseous and, and, and you can have other, well, I don't know the exact side effects, but I have to say, so the side effects are not, not so good for you. And that's why uh, people are now working really on ma uh, manipulating the drug in a way that it becomes, uh, that it has less side effects, but still the beneficial effects that it should have. So that is really also a field on itself within the aging field that people are really working to use these drugs that we already know and that are used in the clinic, but kind of develop them further to make them into something that works better um, on aging without having the side effects that some of these drugs have. So that's why they are not used yet. Although if you are have a specific diseases, you will already get these drugs. So metformin is known by people that are, di that are diabetic patients that already take this drug, but it has also some side effects. So that is, we really have to try to fine tune this repurposing of these drugs to give them less side effects and uh, let them be beneficial for aging in general. So you actually mentioned something really interesting just now, um, the fact that aging currently has not been seen as a disease yet. So what is your opinion on that? Should aging be seen as a disease that we should be treating or not, since it happens to everyone? Well, it is now official. So I, I want to, I, it is officially recognized as a disease. So. About two years ago, the, the World Health Organization actually 
uh, put it in his catalog of, of being a disease. So it's now fine, but it took a lot of effort to convince people that, that it should be treated as a disease. Uh, because it underlies so many other diseases. So we as a community think that instead of treating each of the, the age-related diseases that are there out there, like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, by treating aging or targeting aging, we may be able to treat all these diseases at once. And that's why, why we really were pushing this, um, not myself, but the field was pushing it to be recognized as, as kind of a disease and that's now happened. So that helped us also to, um, to to start this clinical trial because it had to be recognized as kind of a disease before such things could start. So it's it's getting there, um, but not not everybody sees it already like that. I mean, like you say yourself, you didn't re realize that aging is already seen as a disease, um, and that's also what you hear when you when you talk to a lot of people in other research areas. They do not really uh, are not yet convinced that that aging is the factor that we should treat instead of each disease separately and especially in the clinic it's not done at all people in the clinic you for every disease you have a specific uh, expertise and uh, it's really hard to bring these all together and say okay but if we just treat the underlying causes of aging we may be able to to help against all these diseases so that's that's also one of the the challenging things um, that we face as the aging community co convince people and keep convincing people that we should really focus on aging instead of the the one disease mechanism. So every disease separately, we should treat them all together. So how are you guys trying to convince a lot of people that aging is a disease? Is it just by talking to people? Uh, getting your information out there or because I can imagine that a lot of people are still very stubborn about this. Yes, no, that's true. So, I mean, yeah, we, we of course, you have to conference and you talk to people, um, but you also have to show it. And that's what we are trying to do. So what more and more people are trying to show is if you um, find, for example, specific markers for aging, uh, that you can see that these markers influence different things at the same time. Um, and uh, we will probably talk about it later also about the genetics, that there are specific genetic factors that are influencing aging and by that influence all these diseases at once. So we are trying to get more and more evidence that it really is like that, that if you um, treat it or if you find markers of aging, that that really influences all these diseases. Um, and there are also, I mean, um, a, a lot of clinicians that are fighting for this and in the hospitals that are that are trying to to get this across that that we should treat the all elderly patients differently because we should treat them as as they have aging and they and that's why they have multiple diseases instead of talking to each patient saying okay you have this disease plus that disease no you have an underlying mechanism that's aging and if we target that we might be able to treat it so it's it's getting there and um, it's more and more recognized but still, if you compare, it, for example, to cancer or Alzheimer's disease, we are still a really small field. Um, although we think that by by working on aging, we might also help research on those specific diseases. So, uh, but it will take time, I think, a, a couple of years, and then uh, we will get there. Do you think in uh, Do you think in general that aging is a growing field of research that it's maybe exponentially growing now, or? still small no it's, it's definitely growing and especially because now we try also to get investors interested in aging so i mean you see that a lot if you look at the biotech that now the biotech start becoming interested in aging because they see it as an opportunity that if we could treat aging we could make people live healthier for longer uh, and that i think that's definitely gonna help so in in the last couple of years you really have this push um um, to get the also the big pharma is not yet involved, so that's kind of the next step. But you already have this this small uh, companies that are really getting interested in aging and 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 developing therapies, so called therapies for aging. So it's at it's still at the starting phase, but it's growing, and uh, and I think actually it's exponentially growing if you compare it to a couple of years back. It, it, it's definitely already much bigger than it was before. Uh, on the other hand, 
like I said, if you compare it with uh, with cancer or or, di or diabetes or um, Alzheimer, we are still quite small. Uh, so it takes time. So how did you get into aging? Since it must have been an even smaller field back in 2008 when you started your PhD. Yeah, so I was always very intrigued by genetics and I'm still very intrigued by genetics. And um, during my master's, um, I got a course on aging actually um, at my university. And I was really intrigued by the genetics um, because what they what they show in that course is that you have these specific families, these long-lived families, where it seems to be that they did really in their genetics that they have become so old. Um, and I really wanted to find out, and I'm still trying to find out, what is in their genes that make them so long-lived. So I'm not so much focused on just looking at the society and picking out um, the, the specific people uh, that age really long. I'm really interested in seeing, okay, we have this really long-lived individuals that are exceptional or these families. And I want to try to find out what is so special about these families and then specifically at the genetic point of view um, that makes them so long-lived. And then if we find out what these mechanisms are, then we can try to develop therapies or specific kind of lifestyle intervention that mimic that so that we can then hopefully apply this to the general population to make them live longer. So that really intrigued me. This, I have seen these people and they are, it's fascinating if you see them, in this, especially in these families, you get somebody that is 100 uh, with a daughter of an 80, that is 80 years old. And you just think that you have an 80 year old with a 60 year old coming in. It's, it's really amazing how in some of these families, you can really see that they, they look very healthy and that's probably also the reason that they uh, that they become long lived. Okay, maybe can you tell us more about the research you're doing in your lab then, like how you're approaching uh, this? Yeah, so so my so when I started my PhD, I was really um, looking into the genetics of these families and trying to find uh, what was out there, and it took me my whole PhD and even my postdoc. To try to uh, to try to find things because it turns out to be really hard to find something in the genetics that is shared between all these long-lived individuals. So there's not there seems to be no one common thing that makes them all long-lived. So it seems to be that all these long-lived individuals or all these families might have something specific that makes them long-lived. Um, so I'm now trying to to dig deeper into that, and to do that, I try to identify these really specific genetic variants that are really uh, unique to a long-lived individual or his family, um, and then try to find out functionally how they work. So um, I, I'm now creating cell, code, cell lines and um, also mice harboring these specific variants to see how they function and how they actually influence um, the, the well lifespan of the animals or health of the cells, because what we know is these individuals carry many variants. So you have to find the right variants that explain why these people live so long. Um, and, and that's, of course, tricky. So that's why you need these functional studies to really dig deeper into that and find really the variants that could explain why they live so long. And still then, I'm not expecting that every family just carries one variant that explains it. No, I expect that they carry many of such variants that each have a very small effect. Um, and the combination of these variants has made these people um, longer lived. But it's really tricky to find them because um, the, the methodologies to, to find the so-called causal variants is, is not there if, you, if they are so rare. So you really need the functional evidence. And that's what, what my lab is now built on, that's one of the pillars of my lab, where I'm really trying to find out how these genetic variants that we see in these people um, could influence potentially their longevity um, and their health. And I'm mostly interested in their health because I'm not so interested in that they live longer. I'm more interested in the fact that they live longer and healthier because that's also the case. They seem to be um, experiencing less diseases. What kind of uh, people are you looking at? Because I know there's like the seven, the seven Adventists around the world that are like classified as the longest living people. Are you looking at them or other 
other long-lived healthy individuals. So I'm the, in this case, I'm focusing on the data that I have, and that is actually a long-lived family. So these were people that were um, 90 years of age, uh, and they had a brother or sister that was also 90 years of age, or even multiple brothers and sisters. And the reason that I went for these families first is that we expect that there, it's if the variant is then shared between these two long-lived people, it has a higher probability that it's actually related to the longevity. Um, but on top of that, I'm also looking at so-called singletons, which are individuals without a known family history for longevity, um, and that were, for example, 100 years of age or even older, and try to see if we find also variants in the same pathways or the same genes um, that we find in these long-lived families to see if this could explain why they live so long. Um, and yes, you have this very exceptional long-lived people that you were talking about this, for example, the super centenarians, which means that there are individuals above 110 years of age. Um, but I myself do not have access to the genetic data of those individuals. But I know that others are working on those as well. Um, but since there are so little numbers there, it's also really hard to find um, what specifically in their genetics is explaining why they live so long. So can you maybe try to explain in simple terms what some of your results have been in your lab? What kind of variants you have found? Yeah, so um, a lot of this built up on, on my PhD. So the first thing we did is kind of we combined all these long-lived people that we had, and then we looked if there was something shared. And like I said, we didn't find so much, but one really striking thing is, is the APOE gene. Um, so this is a specific gene involved in lipid metabolism. And there is one specific variation in the protein, uh, and that makes you live much shorter, um, which is called the APOE4 allele. On the other hand, there's another allele, which is called the APOE2 allele, which does the opposite and makes you actually live longer. And it is probably because this gene and this protein influence well, lipid metabolism, but also several other things. And it's also one of the main risk factors, for example, for Alzheimer's disease, for cardiovascular disease. So that probably explains why we see less of that in the long-lived individual. Um, but that's also kind of this, this is a very well-studied protein already. So I didn't focus on that, but I tried to find additional um, variants, genetic variants. Um, and it took a really long time before we finally managed. And the way we in the end managed to find some additional variants was by using not only data on very long-lived individuals, but also using data from the general population in relation to how a genetic variant is associated with general aging um, and also health span. And health span is the time that an individual spent before the occurrence of an age-related disease. Um, and when we combined all this together, um, then we actually were able to find some very interesting candidates, um, which, I'm, which is one part that I'm trying to follow up. And the main mechanism that we identified uh, was actually related to, um, um, to what's happening to your blood. If you have a genetic predisposition for having a high iron in your blood, that's actually bad for you. So we actually show that when you reduce, genetically reduce your iron a little bit, that that is one of the main mechanisms that we now identified of being potentially healthy for you. So this is one of the things I'm trying to follow up. And on the other hand, um, I'm trying to focus a lot on this, like I explained before, this, this variants that are very unique for these long-lived families. And then I focus on specific pathways that we know from the model organism research are important for longevity. Like, for example, this, like I explained before, this insulin and mTOR signaling. So I'm trying to find, to identify specific genetic variants in long-lived individuals that are playing a role in this pathway. And I'm now studying what they actually do, um, these specific variants when you put them in a cell or in an animal model um, to see if they could indeed lead to a longer lifespan. But this is, I mean, I, this is ongoing research. It will take some time before we actually know if it works, but that's the, the approach I'm, I'm taking at the moment.
Well, then we can definitely record a part two in about three years time, maybe when you have more research. <laughs> yeah. um, gosh, there's actually so many questions that I want to ask on the last three minutes. Um, but actually, first of all, so you mentioned APOE4, APOE2. How can I myself test if I have this APOE4 or if I don't? Yeah, you can actually very, really easily test that. So you have genetic tests. So there are this company that offer all this genetic testing and APOE is always among uh, the variants they test because it's seen in so many diseases. However, be aware that if you have APOE4, it doesn't mean that you will not get old because we also see quite some long-lived individuals that still carry this APOE4 allele and haven't developed Alzheimer or other kind of diseases. So it's not like, for example, you have some of these really strong genes, um, for example, with breast cancer, this BRCA genes, where it's really clear that if you have that gene, there's a, a very high probability that you will get the disease. So you can kind of do something about it by preventive um, disectomy of your breast, for example. But with APOE4 and APOE2, it's not as clear cut as that. So it could be that you have APOE4 and you're still doing fine. Uh, or you have APOE2 and you're not doing fine. Um, but what you could do already um, is, if you know that you have, you would have APOE4, is that you reduce the amount of um, of lipids that you eat. So, so because that it's known that it it influences that lipid metabolism a lot. So if you then reduce the amount of lipids, that could help. On the other hand, it's also good for you if you do that without APOE4. I mean, many of the things that you would do if you would carry it would, is, are also good for you if you wouldn't carry it. But that's what they try to sell. So people try to sell it as, okay, you have this APOE diet, so test your APOE. If you have it, then follow this specific diet. So people try to make money um, out of it. Um, but it's not so clear cut that if you have it, that it's bad for you. But you have, of course, an increased risk. And increased risk is often enough for people to... Uh, to start changing their habits, for example. Yeah, and then you had also mentioned about the, the heme iron in your blood. So if you can reduce that, then that's also one of these variants that can um, that can help with longevity or with increasing your health span. So how exactly can you do that? So you mentioned you can do it genetically. Is that the only way that you can do it? No, so you can, you can eat less meat for example, to decrease your iron. The thing is, it's a bit, it's a bit, bit more complicated than saying it's, it's one uh, variant explaining it all what we, if with, with the heme metabolism. So what we actually see is if you have multiple genetic variations that could lead to a higher um, heme in your blood, that that is actually detrimental for you. So it's this combination of variants that causes that. So... You, what you can do is, for example, you measure specific kind of genetic variation in individuals and that, and then you can actually see that they have an increased risk of developing a high, uh, iron, having high iron in their blood. And you could treat these people accordingly. I wouldn't say that we need to treat everybody by taking less iron because there are also people that already have a quite low iron and reducing it more is not good because we know that both a very low iron as well as a very high iron is bad for you. And we actually feel that it should be somewhere in the middle where we don't know. We don't know what the range is that we cannot estimate um, based on just genetics. But we feel that if you keep that in a, in a, in a healthy kind of balance um, at a level, that that is beneficial for you. That That's what we... So we use the genetics to find kind of mechanisms, and in this case, it's the heme meta metabolism, that could explain um, this, how different genetic variants lead to the same effect. Okay, I would actually have a question to your uh, the method. So um, you're basically looking at genetic variation in humans as well, right? So uh, what does the time point when you look at this uh, variance actually, how much does this account for uh, like uh, your, um, your results? Because I assume that genes change, like the genome changes over time. So if you look at a genome from a 100-year-old person versus an 80 versus 60 years old, there could be like a huge difference that is just due to age. Um, so how do you account for these differences versus like finding actual variances that play a role in aging? 
Yeah, so now you're talking about uh, the genome changing, but the DNA doesn't change. And we, of course, look at the DNA. So, of course, yeah, it, of course that the DNA also changes. So there are some somatic mutations that happen over time. Um, and we know that these very long-lived people also have more somatic mutations. But we look at the DNA that doesn't change. So we know that they had this DNA from birth, and it hasn't changed over time. Um, so in that way, we rule that out. If you look at other kind of uh, genomic uh, things like gene expression or uh, epigenetics or anything like that, that changes over time, but your DNA doesn't change. So that makes it also possible for us to compare these long-lived people with younger people. Because if you look at other things, it's much harder to compare them because they just, like you said, a lot of effects that you see in these people are there because they aged. And if you then compare them with a younger control group, you don't know if that's the difference is just because they lived longer, so they age had a longer time to kick in, um, or that it's really that they are having something that protects them against that. Um, and with the DNA, we don't have that issue. We still have the issue about finding the right control group, because if you look at younger individuals, you don't know how many of them will actually become long-lived. Um, so that's always a tricky thing, but that's why we really focus on these exceptional long-lived, because we know if we then take the general population as control, that the far majority of these individuals will not reach that age, and the, the, the limited number that will, will not confound um, your analysis too much. But it's, it's a tricky thing, because you don't know which there are probably still some people in your control group that have the possibility to become long-lived. And the ideal control group is no longer alive because the ideal control group would have been the individuals that were born at the same time as these long-lived people but died earlier, but you don't have the DNA. So uh, that's always one of the, the tricky things about uh, studying longevity, that the ideal control group uh, is not there anymore. So do you have any idea why female live longer than male? Has this been studied before? Yes, it's studied. It's not yet clear um, what what is really the, the mechanism behind it. People think that it's, it's both environmental and biological because one of the environmental reasons would be, for example, that uh, females smoke less. And especially uh, if you look years back, which we now see reflected in the long-lived long -lived people, is that at that time women smoke less and, and women work less. So they experience also less stress from work, for example. So they think that at least part of it is definitely environmental driven, but they also believe that part of it is, is it, there's our specific biological mechanisms that make females potentially longer live than males. And that's also what we see in, in model organisms, or not only in humans, that there are really sometimes striking differences between um, the effect of certain interventions on the lifespan of males and females. And there's really, sometimes it works in, in, in males and not in females, and sometimes it's the other way around. So there are definitely biological differences between them. But what these are exactly is, is, is not known yet. It's not that we could now tell you, oh, it's this or that. Um, but we know that there is something biological different between males and females that could explain this, partly. But what I, oh yeah, what I want to say is also that you can expect that the difference will become a bit smaller now, because now you see that they are kind of the environmental conditions become more the same. So we probably will see in the in the coming years that the difference between males and females in lifespan will become smaller. So since most of your research focuses on studying these uh, variants, do you think that the genes that you have or these variants that you have is more important than the lifestyle that you adopt in helping with longevity? Or is it a combination? It's actually the less important part, because um, what we know from studying actually aging and longevity is that the far majority of how long you live is determined by the environment, by environmental factors. We think that that maybe 10 to maximum 20 percent of your lifespan is determined by your genes. So the far majority is in your environment. And that's also something that we could could target much more easy than the genes. Um, there's also then still the effect that some um, gene, gene environment interactions play a role. Because, for example, you have these blue zones. Um, I don't know if you have heard about these. So these are the special places in the world 
where there's a really yeah. Uh, there, there are a lot of long-lived people living in these in these regions, and we know that it is kind of the environment that they have there, in combination with their genes, that makes them so special. Because if you move these people somewhere else, these people will not be long-lived anymore. On the other hand, or and on the other hand, if you move people there, so they have the environmental effects, it's not standard that they will live longer. Um, so we know it's also a combination of of gene and environment. So it's it's environment is has the largest effect. And then we have the genes and the gene uh, environment interaction that have an effect. And the genes are actually the smallest part, uh, I would say. Um, so that's why also a lot of people focus more on, on targeting environmental factors to uh, potentially make us live longer instead of looking at the genetics. Do you think that we'll ever be able to reverse aging? Yes, that's a... That's a tough question. Uh, some people in the field really believe we can and that we can live forever. Um, I think we are far from that. So what I think is that, and that's what I hope as well, is that we can at least slow it so that we can say, okay, we can slow the process of aging, um, compress morbidity so that instead of being sick for a very long time, only at the end of your life, you are for a short time sick and then you die. That's what we, I think we should focus on. Um, but some people believe that in the end we will actually be able to completely get rid of aging and, and live forever. Um, I'm not part of that school, let's put it like that. I'm more um, believing that we can definitely improve um, healthy aging, um, and that's also my goal, but I don't know how much we can actually improve the maximum lifespan. Um, so the maximum lifespan now in a human has been 122 years. Um, I'm not sure how much further we can reach with that. But what I hope and what I think is that we at least can have more people age healthier and then at the end of their life, they still die. Um, but they are they are, would also be fine with that, I guess, because they haven't suffered from all these this age-related diseases that are now uh, causing massive uh, a massive burden to our healthcare system because that's what we see, the Alzheimer's disease. Is, is we, we call this the, the Alzheimer's disease wave or other kind of terms that is coming to us. We know that these diseases are going to massively influence um, the next generation. And the idea is by treating aging that we will get rid of that. But I don't know if we will ever be able to really treat aging in a way that it doesn't exist anymore. Um, but let's see, maybe, uh, maybe people will prove me wrong. <laughs> Okay, I actually have a question concerning the this maximum lifespan. So how is this determined as the maximal lifespan of humans? So this was just the longest lived person that ever lived. So this was Marie Calment from France. There's always a debate now if she was really that old or that her daughter took her place and uh, um, and she was not really 122 because she's still see, seen as an outlier in that sense. So then I think the next long-lived person ever was um, on top of my head 119 years of age. So she was really a step further with 122. Um, so she had, but they they had her birth record. So it's really known that she lived this long. And of course, there are specific areas in the world where we will never know how how long people will live because we don't have the birth records. But for her, it's known that she. Uh, was 122 years old when she died. So she's considered the longest living human ever. And she smoked and she did all other kinds of things that are considered bad, but still managed to, uh, to age to 122. How do you think we're going to start treating aging since now it's seen as a disease so we can start treating it? How and when, when will we actually do this? Yeah, so that's a good question. So there's a lot of discussion about when does aging actually start. So some people believe it already starts when you're still an embryo. Some people say it's after puberty or after development is complete. So people use different timelines when they actually say um, it's starting. But realistically, we will not treat our younger people. Um, we will start treating people um, well, probably when they are around 40, 50 years of age. And the ideal time that you would start treating people is actually 
um, when they are around 50 or 60 years of age, because then it's, they still haven't developed most of the age-related diseases. And you could still treat them in a way that you would um, compress these diseases or in this case, delay these diseases um, or let them completely disappear. Um, and that's what we are kind of aiming for. So we are not aiming of treating already our, our babies or our, our younger children. It's more the idea that we would start treating people before we see the signs of them developing the disease so that we are still on time um, to prevent the, the, the disease and also the multiple diseases at the same time, which is called multimorbidity. And how will we do this? So there are different ways. I mean, um, we like I said, one of the things that we can do is take these people, look at how they eat, how they exercise and change that, change their behavior, because that's most of the time the, 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 the big issue that they have. That, that, that turns out that indeed their environment is not ideal. So if we change their environment, we might uh, help them. And another, another, a lot of other people are thinking, okay, we should develop kind of pills, like I said before, that we just give these people pills so that these things do not happen. So there also is a lot of research ongoing into finding indeed um, drugs um, that could do that, that could uh, make sure that the disease doesn't develop. Um, I think we will potentially talk about it later, but for example, that you have now this really nice treatments that they found in mice where they could rejuvenate the mice and uh, by giving them specific factors. And then you see that these, these, these become young again and they, can, uh, they don't develop the disease and they die later. So that's what people are focusing on. Um, so you have the two schools. One is really focusing on pharmacological inhibition or treatment that would do that. And others think that by just um, changing their behavior, um, we would already get quite far and prevent a lot of things from happening. Uh, because a lot of people that come to the hospital, it's really clear they have they have do something wrong with their environment that, that makes them sick. And if you can just change that, that helps. Of course, there are always things that are caused by, by for example, gen by your genetics that you cannot prevent by your environment. And those people we definitely need to treat with specific medication. But for the far majority of us, um, keeping track of your nutrition and, and exercising enough will help um, to make you feel healthier and also potentially um, live longer. My parents are like roughly 50 now, so I should tell them to listen to this podcast. Um, to make sure that they do the right things now since they're around 50. And then I have a little sister who is 12 right now. She's actually just turned 13. So for cases with young kids, or also take me, I'm 24 now, um, should I start thinking about doing intermittent fasting, reducing the amount I eat, or am I still too young? Well, I, I so like I don't think you are too young to do it. Um, that's definitely not the case. So I mean, of course, the earlier you start, the more you can prevent. Um, so yes, I, I, I would say that you can start already now, but to adhere to this for the rest of your life is going to be a challenge. So, and that's what you also see a lot that once people have lived their life, um, like they have children and have have had all these kind of things, and they become like fifty or fifty-five, and then they're thinking, okay. Now uh, I'm at the end of my working life. Uh, what can I do next? I still want to do a lot of things. I want to uh, be healthy. And then they realize, okay, now I really want to do something about it. But of course, if you realize that earlier and you already want to do it now, it's of, of course much better. But a lot of people start realizing that only later in life and that's why they, when they want to change. So that's, that's also the group we target. Um, just the 50 to 55 year olds um, or, or even a bit older where you can still do that and these people you also see it's it's much easier to to motivate them to do something because they realize that otherwise their end is near but if they can still change something now so it's like it's the last train they can catch so they should do it now and otherwise it's too late and in your case you're still young so you could say ah I still have enough time. I don't have to do it now. I can do it tomorrow. Uh, but of course, the earlier you start, the better. Starting about 12, I wouldn't do it because of course, if you do this kind of things, it also influences your development. So I wouldn't do anything like this before you are um, 
mature, um, maybe say 21 or something, that you're kind of fully developed, your body's fully developed, and then um, you would do this kind of things. Calorie restriction and doing exercise, it puts stress on your body. And I think that's what's thought to, um, to improve longevity. But are there different types of stress? Because I've also heard that like going in the sauna, this kind of thermal stress is, can be very uh, beneficial. But then as a PhD chemist, I tend to be stressed every day, just work related stress. So is this considered the same kind of stress or is that kind of stress unhealthy for me? Well, you have different kinds of stress for sure. So, so you, for example, you have physical stress and your psychological stress and something like a sauna, you would consider like physical stress or, 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 or coming um, um, from, from, from different sources and uh, physiological stress is something that you put on yourself. Um, and what stress wise, what they actually think is that it's not that you have, if you are, have a lot of stress, that's good for you. It's actually good if you are more stress resistant. So we see that in model organisms, but also in humans. So that if you are more stress resistant, it's good for you. And one way to become more stress resistant is giving your body sometimes a bit of stress to kind of provoke this reaction. But if you are on constant stress, like chronic stress, like a PhD, that's actually not considered so healthy for you. Unless you are really stress resistant, then it will not matter. Um, but the people where stress is, uh, what, what we see with stress is actually stress resistance is the thing that makes potentially people longer lived. It's not um, that they are constantly under stress because that's not good for you. Chronic stress is known to be actually uh, causing earlier mortality um, so that's something that you shouldn't do but a little bit of stress is is not so bad and if you look in the in the body of course all these stressors also have different effects um, so one of the things that i'm for example studying when i'm going back to this genetic variants is if you stress a cell with such a genetic variant does this cell do better um, under specific stress and then we see actually that these kind of cells um, ideally are more stress resistant so they do better under stress and that's what we also think is happening potentially in long-lived people um, that they have these mechanisms that make them more stress resistant so that they can better cope with stress but it's not that they are uh, under more stress or under less stress okay so basically you're telling us to not do a phd if we want to live long well i think it depends i mean i've also done a phd <laughs> so i wanted to say it's also how much stress you put on yourself as a phd i mean i know that a lot of phd put a lot of stress on themselves uh, but it's your own stress that you put on yourself and it's not so much the outside stress and i mean if you can try to regulate that it's it's good you should be you should really be aware that you're not under constant stress because that's definitely not good but you can regulate it in if you can regulate it in a way that you sometimes have a peak of stress um, that can still still be good for your system to kind of adapt and potentially become more stress resistant okay so based, uh, one more question actually concerning the stress um so how often should we then be exposed to these kind of peak stress uh, points? Like, I, I mean, and what is a longer period of stress? Like, for example, I assume if you're writing papers or so, you're stressed for, uh, I don't know, like a month or even two months. Uh, is that too long already? Uh, and should you make sure that you have like breaks in between or like what would you uh, recommend? I, I am honestly I don't have a recommendation because it's it's not it's not my expertise. But I would say that one or two months stress is already quite long. It's more kind of it's 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 short term stress where you um, where you work on a project and really want to finish it at that time where you have really peak stress because the deadline is the next week. I think this kind of stress is not so bad. But if you take it longer, um, then it, you will also notice it because you will sleep less. You will eat uh, less well you really feel that your body is not doing well um, so i think prolonged stress you will feel directly because you will feel that your your body is is not doing well well with with short-term stress yes you have a short-term uh, effect on your brain and that's actually making things happen most of the time um, that's that's not so bad for you. but if it's really prolonged and you're starting to eat uh, bad and do not feel well, then you're for sure having too much stress and you should relax a bit, uh, I would say.
So maybe we can get back into reversing aging um, and talk a bit about the Yamanaka factors, which I heard um, or I read about that they can, that's what's what they think can help reverse aging. So I don't know, maybe you know a bit about that, that you can, you can explain to us. Yes. So the Yamanaka factors are these factors that are normally expressed in your, in your stem cells, in your body. And these stem cells are kind of kept in a, in a, a state that, that they can still develop in whatever they want. So they are kind of in a youthful state. Um, and the idea is now, and that they've, they, they've shown that in mice, is that if you treat these mice with these factors in their whole body, then they're, they start to rejuvenate. Because we know that if we overexpress these specific markers, um, that we can then rejuvenate the cells in the body. So they have done that in mice, and they actually show that they could treat specific age-related conditions with that. So it's, it's a lot of hype around it. Um, because they now people feel, okay, maybe we can do this in humans as well, and we can rejuvenate our body and see what happens. So it definitely, from the mouse, if, from the model organism point of view, it definitely has, has, has the potential. And I think the next step will be that these groups that have found that will now try to implement it as well in human studies to see what we could do. And it will start really small, of course, because we cannot just do it in a whole human but it might be used, for example, they, they did it in the mice to treat blindness of these mice. So it might be that they are now going to try it on humans and see if they can make blind people see again. But there's always a risk because we as humans are much more developed than most of these model organisms. And if you would do it to your whole body, what will happen to your brain, for example? We have no clue. So before it would be in a stage, a state where we would actually apply this to humans, um, to treat aging, in general, it will it will be a long way from here. But the the findings in the mice are were very promising, where they could really see that they could rejuvenate them, and and they uh, they look much younger again and lived longer. So, in mice, it definitely worked. Okay, so my question would be um, concerning the, the age in general. So you said um, these mice were rejuvenated. Uh, so how did you return, determine that they were younger than before? Because their actual age is still growing, right? Um, so can you like um, go into more detail there? Yeah, so they did different things. So they looked at... Um at how they function, so uh, the physiologically, so they, they, they could run better, they, um, they could do different things. And also they looked into specific in the organs of these mice, I think, and they also showed that there was rejuvenation there. And the, the thing that they were uh, using as, an out, as one of the main outcomes was this blindness. So they had these mice that were having this uh, blindness and with this treatment, they could treat that blindness so that these mice could see again. And that was of course, um, that, that they could test that, of course, in these mice. And that was the main thing that they really um, looked for. And they saw that these mice could see again. So it means that they treated that, that part. Um, but also I think in general, so they did also experiments where they did it just in general in mice. Um, and there they really see that they, they look younger, so you can also look. You can see a mouse, and it looks old. It's like a human. When you see an old human, you can see. And with these mice, it's the same. And when you treated them, they really, their fur was better. All these kind of things. Um, so in, so so they use all these kind of parameters to to determine that they were actually looking younger and and doing better uh, than the animals that were not treated. All right, so that's part one with Yoris. Thank you all so much for listening. We really hope that you enjoyed it. We will be coming out with the second part, which will be released next week, where we will dive into more detail on the factors that control aging and the so-called Yamanaka factors. Super exciting. In the meantime, you can follow us on our Offspring Magazine Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram accounts. And you can follow Yoris on Twitter to stay up to date with his research. His Twitter is at Yoris Dalen. See you next week. 
Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group, known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srinath Rankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye.